Chance is one of our favorite alums from the Maxwell School and, and is generous enough to come back and, and share his experiences with our students. And really, I think there's just so much information to learn. And I, we'll put this out here as a little public service announcement. Um, I really encourage you to attend these career connection events because as you will we'll certainly find out in a moment um, after Chance gets a chance to explain things to you, um, <clears throat> the value of listening to alum and their experiences goes beyond the topical information that they're sharing about what they do in the organizations that they work for. It's really about you know how Maxwell plays out into the world, how the skills you have or don't have even are, are things that you, know, you need to be aware of. And I really am, am um, thankful that you all came today and encourage you to continue to attend these career connection events regardless of who's coming in topic. I think you'll, you'll realize you'll learn an awful lot. Um, to get back to Chance, he is currently serving as director for World Vision. I know you all have bios and um, for the international operations in Mali and has been there most recently and just back for a couple of days. <laughs> Where are you, right? Um, and has a career as a leader and development worker. As I mentioned, he's a Maxwell graduate and I'm gonna turn it over to Chance to kind of fill you in on the details and, and tell his story and his own words. But I'm okay. grateful that you came today Great. and among all the other obstacles, really happy to have you here. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for coming, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to come back to Maxwell. It really is a pleasure. Um, and thanks for coming, because I understand that there was a, a panel discussion earlier today with four distinguished panelists also talking about careers in international development and other things. So you, you've come to this one. I don't know if you're doing double duty <laughs> or if you skipped that one, but thanks, thanks for coming. Um, I also want to recognize that you have a lot of distinguished speakers coming through here and uh, my mother's also a Maxwell alumna and so I get some of the propaganda and I, I see that Hillary was here so I'm you know it, it, she's, a, she's a hard act to follow um, <laughs> but I'll try not to say the same things that, as, as she did. Um, th this is billed as a career talk and so I will talk some about career issues but I might talk a little off topic. Um, I was here about 10 months ago at that time, I was in a, in a rather long vacation for me, which was, I think I had five weeks between one posting and another. I was a little bit relaxed. I spent a lot of time preparing for my remarks. Uh, and therefore, if you want to see them, I'm, I'm sure they'll be made available at some point online again, and you can so watch that. And I might say some of the same things as I said last year, but I didn't prepare uh, as much uh, this year, so it might be a little bit more off the cuff. How much time do we have? An hour. Well, no, I just, I just want to be cognizant. I'd like to give the students some opportunities for, for question and answer. So an hour? Yeah, all right. So let me see if I can talk for maybe a, about 30-ish minutes, and, uh, and then we'll go from there. Uh, as I reflected about what I could speak about here, um, I thought I could talk about what's right and what's wrong in the relief and development industry, and that might be interesting for you. Um, but it wouldn't necessarily encourage you to get a job in the industry unless you thought, oh, that's what's wrong about the industry, let me go and fix it. Uh, I thought I could talk about my experience and that might be interesting. I thought I could tell you a little bit about what my organization, World Vision, does, <coughs> particularly in Mali, where I'm the national director. I thought I could go into some detail about a food and nutrition crisis that's going on right now in the Sahel Belt across West Africa, which includes Mali. I even thought about talking to you about U.S. foreign policy and how that affects Mali. There may be some IR students or NPA IR students in the room, I don't know. Uh, and ultimately, I, I could also give you some advice on how to get a job in relief and development. And maybe I'll touch on some of those, but I certainly won't do them all. Uh, and I'll try to stick mostly to the career focus. Um, there's this lovely bio that was written about me, and it's mostly accurate. Um, <laughs> and it's also a flat piece of paper. So let me step back a little bit and say something about my work. I find that it's interesting to hear about other people's paths, and nobody ever has the same path. But once in a while, there's something on somebody else's path that you hear that you think, oh, that's similar to me. Or, oh, I never would have thought of that happening. Maybe I could do that. And, and I'll say that as I reflect on my own path, one thing that I have realized is that I was without a plan. And only looking backwards on it does the thread seem to make sense. But going forward, I, I never thought that I would be here where I am today. Uh, and yet, here I am. So uh, I, I started my career in relief and development, if you will, uh, when I was 16. And I was an exchange student in Brazil, sponsored through Rotary International. 
And Brazil would have probably been considered a developing country at that time. It was certainly not the, the Brazil that we know today that is really seen as now an emerging uh, economic powerhouse. Some of you may have heard the, the acronym BRICS. Brazil, Russia, India, China. What's the S? South Africa, thank you. Yeah, um, It's great to be in the ivory tower because you know all these things. <laughs> and when you're in the real world, you forget. Um, so, uh, and, and I, I, I met this guy who had a school and they, they were teaching English there at the school and Brazilians wanted to learn English. And uh, I was a native English speaker, so he asked me if I'd teach. I was probably cheap labor for him because I was 15 or 16, I guess. And, um, and I think that my, my year in Brazil as a student and also as a teacher really affected my view on the world. Uh, some of you are from the United States, some of you are not. I think we can all agree that most people in this country don't have a very broad view of the world and in many ways it's getting narrower and narrower even though we're in an age of the internet where there's so much information available but many of us choose to look more and more narrowly at the world. And so being there really broadened my horizons and probably made me wake up a little bit and look at the world. And so when I was a student in university, I went to Bowdoin College in Maine, uh, I started to get a bit interested in Africa. I think I had a friend, I, I, I had a friend who was from South Africa, and uh, as I read about South Africa, these were the apartheid days when it was a very repressive regime. Um, and I just didn't understand it. So I thought, well, let me go off to South Africa and, and maybe if I live there and study, I can understand it. So I applied to university and I didn't manage to get a visa. Uh, but I think by that point, it, now looking back at my thread, I can see that there was this thread moving towards international development, a fascination with Africa that hasn't stopped, that led me to being an African history major. And not getting a visa in South Africa led me to finding an exchange program where I felt confident I would get a visa. Um, I studied for a year in Senegal and West Africa. And uh, I would say uh, I, at that point, still didn't have a clue what I wanted to do in my life. So when I graduated from university, I did what a lot of people without a clue did. I, I became a teacher. <laughs> and uh, I had the opportunity first to teach English as a second language here in the US. I taught at a prep school, Northfield Mount Her Herman School out in western Massachusetts. Uh, and then through a little bit of luck and a little bit of networking, uh, I managed to get a job teaching English in China. This was the mid-80s. It was a time of opening. It was before the massacre in Tiananmen Square. It was before China took off as an economic powerhouse. Uh, and actually, it was a Syracuse connection. There was a, a Chinese student here at Syracuse who somehow my mother came across through a friend of a friend. And she learned of my interest and she said, I think I can work something out and she set me up with a teaching job at her university in China. When I decided that I'd had enough of that, uh, part of it was a sense that I had been working at elitist institutions. Northfield Mount Hermon School is a fine prep school. I'd happily send my son there, but it's an elitist institution. And as a product of the public schools, I was interested in, in, in maybe seeing if I could also go and work in a public school and make my contribution there. And so I applied for a master's degree program and went off to the Boston area and needed a job. And I saw a sign on campus that some agency on campus was looking for work-study students. Uh, those of you from the U.S. may be familiar with the work-study system where uh, the federal government partially subsidizes uh, students to work in nonprofit organizations. And so I walked into the door of this organization called World Teach, and World Teach had started sending volunteers to serve as teachers uh, into Kenya, and they were planning a program in China. And I had just been teaching in China for a year and a half, so it was a good match. And through my graduate program, and this could happen to you, I don't know, uh, I found that I enjoyed my work in the nonprofit organization a lot more than I enjoyed my student teaching in the public schools. I thought I was better as an NGO administrator than as a teacher of public schools, uh, history students, social studies. Uh, and that the teaching market was lousy. And so I just took an easy road and I stayed with World Teach and they had an opening and I just stayed. And I became the assistant director where I stayed for six years. And during that time we built it up and we had sent teachers to about 10 countries by the time I left in 1995. 
And once again, I really didn't know what I wanted to do next. I just knew that I'd done enough. I'd made six years of contributions. I was getting bored. Somebody new should come in with some energy that I was lacking. So I quit, traveled a little bit, took a few classes um, in business school in Boston, liked it, and decided, OK, let me do this full time. Uh, and so I actually had hoped to go to business school to learn how business people think, but then to apply that to the nonprofit sector. And alas, uh, one business school accepted me, but didn't give me enough financial assistance to make it a good deal for me. Uh, and knowing that I wanted to go back to the nonprofit sector, I didn't really want to be saddled with sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars worth of loans. My favorite business school rejected me. Uh, and on a lark. Uh, Two people said to me, why don't you apply for an MPA? One was my boss, who had an MPA. And he said, look, the, the MBA program is great, but business is really all driven by the bottom line. You may do some great things, maybe a good education, but it's all about the bottom line. But when you do an MPA, you're looking at multiple and conflicting objectives. And he gave me the example of a small town in Texas. Anybody from Texas? Okay, a small town in Texas having to decide, do we spend $45,000 this year and buy a new ambulance? By buying that new ambulance, how many lives do we think we might save? Is it worth $45,000? And that's a pretty interesting question, isn't it? That's a little bit different from the bottom line. So he, he convinced me I should think about an MPA program. And uh, lo and behold, Stephen Lux here at Maxwell was somebody I sent to Thailand. Uh, through World Teach. He was, he was an anomaly. He didn't teach. He actually, we placed him in an NGO. It was sort of our host NGO in Thailand. They had given us a lot of assistance. So the deal was we would give them uh, one person per year. So Steve worked for them, the Population and Community Development Association in Thailand. It goes by the acronym PDA. And Steve came back and went to Maxwell. Steve, by the way, is also from, from around here. I think his father and my father live about a mile from each other. Uh, and he said, hey, why don't you apply? Your father lives there. You can stay with him for free. So on a lark, I applied. Uh, I was very fortunate to get the John Ben Snow Fellowship, which paid for me to study at Maxwell and also allowed me to work for the Central New York Community Foundation, uh, where I learned a lot but also got a little bit of income. Uh, and I'm, I will forever be grateful to, to the, John, the, the family of John Ben Snow. And I hope every time I come, I, I try to acknowledge that, and I hope that the next time you talk to the Snow family or anybody who deals with the Snow family, you'll remind them that I'm forever grateful. Um, and as the flyer says, I really thought that I was going to take a, a turn in my career and be focused domestically. I thought I'd been out. I'd lived in China. I'd lived in Brazil. I'd lived in Senegal. Uh, I'd sent people overseas for six years. Now it's time to sort of turn inward. The U.S. is plagued with problems. Let me try to help. And the work at the Central New York Community Foundation also helped me think about sort of some of the problems that we, that we faced in the northeast of the U.S. And as the flyer says, a Maxwell connection uh, led me to Bosnia. So there was a board member at the Community Foundation who is a Maxwell alumna, Deborah Alexander. I don't know if she ever comes in and talks. I think she works for USAID somewhere. Um, she was with the Board of Elections here. She was asked to go and work on some elections in Bosnia. This was shortly after the war ended. I met her. We were talking. I said, hey, I'd love to go and help out with an election. Could I do that? She said, well, maybe. Send me your CV. And it's points like that that change your career. And sometimes you don't realize it at the time. I had no desire to go and work in relief and development. I had a desire to go to Bosnia for two weeks because it seemed like a cool thing to do. <laughs> and somebody else was going to pay for it. And at that time, I didn't even know they were going to give me $90 a day, what do they call it, I don't know, per diem or something. You know, I didn't even know that. I thought I was volunteering. So uh, off I went uh, three months after graduating from, from Maxwell to Bosnia-Herzegovina for two weeks to be an election supervisor in a village somewhere in Bosnia. And uh, that changed my life. Because what I saw in the Balkans and we have somebody from the Balkans here, <laughs> uh, shocked me. I had never been in a country which had so recently been to war. Um, 
And, you know, I found Bosnians to be just wonderful people and really friendly, and I enjoyed hanging out with them and drinking coffee and everything, and I just couldn't figure out why they would want to be killing each other, neighbor against neighbor. So I resolved to go back, uh, and at the time I was naive. I thought, let me just go for maybe three months, and I can make a little contribution and learn something and then go home and carry on with my nonprofit career. Um, uh, and I actually turned down a really good job offer here. The area of Lowell in Massachusetts was starting a, a community foundation, and since I had just been working at the Central New York Community Foundation, I knew something about that, and they were kind enough to offer me to be their first director. And by that point, I just realized, no, there was, there was some, some call within me, something compelling that I needed to go to Bosnia. And they were so kind, they said, well, just go to Bosnia, you come back in three months and, and, and the job will be yours. We can wait, because, you know, it's a startup operation. But something in me told me that, no, I, I, I needed to maybe go for longer. So there was another election, my good luck. I got on the team, my good luck, a little bit of persistence. Uh, and I packed two suitcases. And after the election was over, I went to Sarajevo and I slept on a friend's sofa and pounded the pavement. I just went office to office. Uh, email was just getting popular at that point, and I found an internet cafe, and so I would send off my CVs, uh, call people up on the telephone. And uh, the way I actually got my job is, is, I think, interesting and worth relating. There were coordination meetings where different actors, mostly NGOs, would get together on a weekly basis, talk about what's going on, and they were open. So some job seekers like me would just go and attend, hear what's going on, try to talk to people. Uh, and there was this one fellow, Jim Kelly, I'd been trying to reach him and I hadn't had any success. I'd email my CV to him. He was the director of Catholic Relief Services. And uh, I think I, I managed to be late to most of these coordination meetings and this time I got there on time. And so as people were introducing themselves, he, he said he was Jim Kelly. And I thought, oh, that's Jim Kelly. So when the meeting ended, he was leaving the room, and I, I literally chased him out of the room. And he said, excuse me, you know, he's, he's ahead of me. I said, excuse me, are you Jim Kelly? And he turns around, he said, yeah. I said, I'm Chance Briggs, I, I sent you my CV. And, he, and he's like, uh, yeah, okay, well, you know, what is it again you do? And, I, I, and then he said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, you know, could we meet? You, and, and he said, sure, yeah, you can come in on Monday. And it happened to be that he was working on a grant proposal that was going to be funding a new project, that the new project was going to need uh, a project manager, and that the donor was insisting on an expatriate project manager, uh, not a Bosnian. And um, it still took three or four months from that meeting until when I landed in Bosnia with the job. Uh, but if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't gone out and attended meetings and literally chased a guy out of the room, uh, things might have taken a different turn. That might have been a good turn, I don't know. You, you, you just never know. And, and so I, uh, I did whatever the flyer says I, I did <laughs> here, and um, I, I, I managed projects that were funded by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, which was our donor at the time. We had some other donors. The U.S. government, State Department has a uh, program called the uh, Bureau for Population, Refugees, and Migration. They were funding some of our projects. Uh, and once I got my foot in the door of a large relief and development agency, all I had to do was prove myself, and then you can, more or less, you can stay if you show some flexibility about where you go. So uh, my fiancé and I decided that we would like to go to Africa, and I put in a request, and lo and behold, they sent me to Nigeria, where I was a country representative. Uh, and then there was an invasion of Afghanistan by the U.S. government that pushed a lot of Afghans uh, south and west to become refugees in Iran and in, in Pakistan. And I was asked to go to Pakistan to work on that. Uh, so I was a deputy relief coordinator. Uh, and then I stayed in Pakistan and uh, did some consulting work and then picked up a job with Interact Worldwide. It's a British charity that works in the area of sexual and reproductive health. Uh, and I was a, the project director and country director for two years with Interact Worldwide. And then there was a terrible, terrible earthquake in 2005 in Pakistan. And I experienced it. I wasn't in the earthquake zone, but I was in Islamabad, about uh, 60 miles away. 
It was the scariest thing I had ever experienced in my life. And uh, we'd actually been thinking about leaving Pakistan, but after the earthquake, I thought, no, I, I, I need to chip in. Uh, and my organization wasn't doing relief. And so again, uh, this time I wasn't pounding the pavement, but I was making phone calls and, and talking to people and submitting my CV. And, um, and I ended up as the relief director for World Vision in Pakistan. And from there, I've stayed with World Vision with postings in Mozambique as the, as the program director, and now in Mali as the national director. So that is sort of a synopsis of, of my trail, if, if, if you will. Uh, the last time I spoke, I think I spoke some about trends in the field, and I thought I, I could maybe say a few things about trends in the field, because I think it does connect to getting a job in the field. One trend that I've seen is that there's a big push towards monitoring and evaluation, towards providing evidence, towards having a, an approach to your work that is evidence-based, towards being able to demonstrate that we are having impact. And, you know, uh, once in a while, shamefully admitting, no, we're not having impact and we need to change our approach. Engineers Without Borders is doing this great thing. I don't know if anybody's heard of them. Uh, you know, there's Doctors Without Borders and then everybody copies that. Farm, farm, I don't know. <laughs> Lawyers Without Borders, Journalists Without Everything. Engineers Without Borders, which I think is based in Canada, they have started every year to produce not only their annual report, which is the glossy pictures, all the great stuff, the finances. They're now also producing separate an annual failure report. And they're saying, look, yeah, we fail sometimes. You've got to take risks. It's not always going to be successful. And you can learn from failure. And we're committed to learning from failure. But not only that, we're committed to transparency. We want other people to learn from our failure. Now, that's an extreme, and you don't find too many agencies doing that. But my point is that an evidence-based approach is becoming very, very important. Uh, it's throughout the world, certain donors even more so. The U.S. government, through the U.S. Agency for International Development, has very much been focused on evidence and part of the USAID Forward, I think Fast Forward, I don't know, they have some initiative, USAID Forward, I think it's called, is actually moving uh, towards pulling the monitoring and evaluation function back in-house because for years USAID has outsourced it. And the problem there is that I'm World Vision and I have to evaluate my project and maybe I manage to pull in some quote-unquote third-party consultant who's going to evaluate my project, but I'm paying them out of project funds. So you don't necessarily get something that's independent. And there are also quality concerns. So um, I encourage people thinking about a, a, a career in relief and development to look at whether they can, if they're interested in this, to beef up their monitoring and evaluation skills. Um, it's not for everybody. It's not for me. Uh, it, for people who love statistics, it's great. There's, even, there's more and more statistics in, in, in monitoring. Uh, I, there's a trend uh, towards uh, economists sort of doing randomized samples on, on programs to see, you know, are you really having impact? There's two big books that came out. There's, there's a place at Yale. I think Yale is the International Poverty Action, IPA. And then at MIT is the Jamal Somebody Poverty Lab, I think. And both these outfits, and they work together. And uh, um, their lead people have written some books, and you can read about this. Um, and, and I think, uh, so there's a big focus there. So for people who like surveys, people who like uh, data and all that, m and &E is probably a good career path. Um, a second thing that I have to tell you about as a trend in the field is what I would call localization. That is more and more many organizations and many donors who pay for the work that we do are saying, folks, you need to localize. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, in many cases, it means they want to see more people from the country occupying leadership positions and management positions in the organization that's implementing projects. And that makes sense. Why should we as foreigners come in and call all the shots? Uh, and by the way, as foreigners, when we work in, in many countries, unless we're volunteers, uh, we tend to be rather expensive compared to national staff, right? Uh, we get a lot of benefits. We are in an international labor market, which most of the time is much more expensive than the local labor market. Most of the time, we don't speak the local language or languages, or we speak one of them and, and maybe don't speak it well. Um, and, you know, I think in the aid industry, and it is an industry, I have to say that, in our industry, there's also a, a push towards 
having the approach towards development be led by the country and not be led by outsiders. Um, and to ensure that significant decisions about projects uh, and strategies are made in country and not by outsiders. Now, there's a bit of fluff there because there's still a lot of big organizations and governments that push countries in certain directions. Uh, in Mozambique, where you and I both work, 50% of the government budget is coming from institutional donors, and that's mostly bilateral assistance, European countries, uh, and also the European Union. So, if the European Union says to the Ministry of Health, you know, we really think you ought to adopt this policy on you know, something, uh, the Minister of Health is likely to listen. So there still is tremendous influence, and particularly because the power of, of the dollar, as it were. Um, but more and more, uh, there is a push towards letting countries drive their own development, and we find a way to support that. Uh, President Obama has a big initiative that Catherine Bertini is partly the brainchild behind. It's called Feed the Future. You may have heard of it. Uh, Feed the Future is a food security initiative of the U.S. government. And Feed the Future actually calls for countries to follow a country-led approach, and there is a, it's called CADAP, Country, I don't know, Country Assistance Development Plan, I don't know, but basically the country sort of says, this is what we want to do in an area of food security. This is what needs to be done. These are our strategic directions. And after that, and only after that, can the U.S. government, through the Feed the Future program, come in and say, okay, how do we work together to support your strategy? Okay. Um, so I, I, think, I think the localization piece in relief and development does affect the job market. Uh, and, you know, more or less it means probably fewer and fewer jobs for people who aren't from the country. And yet, uh, I would say another piece of this is that more and more agencies like mine are hiring people from uh, the country where we work and sending them to work in other countries. Uh, and so more and more, you know, I mean, I've got, I think, 10 Malians who work for World Vision outside of Mali, somewhere in our World Vision world. There are 50-some Zimbabweans doing that. So mo more and more, also, our agencies are becoming international in how we staff ourselves. Um, now, our top echelons are still a whole bunch of old white men, mostly. But uh, <laughs> more and more, as you get down a level or two, <laughs> Uh, this is on tape. Oh. <laughs> uh, our, our president's a really good guy. <laughs> He's not so old either. Uh, but, but yeah, he, he is very white. <laughs> um, another thing that I'm seeing in the field is the importance of technology. Um, there's an estimate I read that by 2015, 30% of the people on the planet are going to have a smartphone, which to you guys might not sound weird because you live in the smartphone world, but I live in Mali. And to me, I'm amazed, right? Um, technology is driving a lot of things. Um, and it, it, it's this strange, for me, it's almost like a dichotomy. Like on one hand, my secretary uh, doesn't even know how to take a picture and make it go from you know, 85 megabytes to 223 kilobytes so that she can email it. So on one hand, there's a lot of technology out there that we, we use badly. But on the other hand, there's a real push in, in relief and development to, um, to use that technology for the betterment of people, uh, to try to put that technology in people's hands, um, or to use that technology to do a better job with accountability. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, we at World Vision have pioneered something that we have a terrible acronym. It's LMMS, Last Mile Mobile Solutions. And if you hear that, you'll have no idea what it is. But basically, in, when, when we do distributions of food for, for people uh, who don't have enough food, and we're doing this across the Sahel right now with, with the food and nutrition crisis, the typical old school is you get something called a ration card. Your name is handwritten on a list of beneficiaries who are receiving it. There's all these paper records. Eventually, you, maybe you type them into an Excel file or something. Uh, maybe you even have a, a database that you'd use. The new thing is we take your picture, we ask your name, we input it all into a handheld. It gets <coughs> dumped into a big data file. We immediately have electronic records of everything. We've got your photograph. You get a, a plastic ID card with a barcode. And when you come, just like you came in to scan here, <laughs> uh, 
you get scanned when you get your food ration. Okay? Uh, and there's a lot of other things we can do with it. And in fact, we're also using it for cash distributions, which is another trend in, in relief, cash transfer programming, where you say, look, we know that you guys are needy. We know that you're probably hungry. But rather than giving you sorghum, when you don't really want sorghum, you'd prefer millet or maize, or actually what you need is cooking oil, we give you cash, and you can make your choices. And as long as the market functions, and you're at Maxwell School, so you learn a lot about how markets function and don't, but as long as the market functions, uh, it's, you're giving people choices, and you're also helping uh, the local market because local merchants are able to actually sell products to people with that cash you've provided rather than you importing it from Kansas City, which is where we import most of our wheat from or, uh, and our, and our uh, corn from when we are doing food distributions. So uh, the last mile mobile tech uh, solutions is one technology example. Um, cell phone companies, uh, in developing countries are now becoming banks. In some cases, they're not registering at banks, but they're providing some banking or other financial services. And so, uh, as I mentioned, we are getting ready to do cash distributions in Mali, and we are registering people through our fancy system with the barcodes. We are also partnering with Orange, which is a French telecoms giant, and Orange is actually going to be distributing the money to people in villages through cell phones. And what you do is you take your cell phone and you, your credit's on it because Orange has sent it to you. And you go to the merchant and you say, I'd like to buy some stuff. And the merchant takes your credit or, or gives you cash. You, you know, certain merchants, they're, they're set up to give you cash. And then they get reimbursed by Orange. It's great, right? It's much more efficient. It takes away a lot of the risk of carrying cash, being robbed and all that. Uh, and you know, we're, we're, uh, we're an agency that we, we do give things out, but at the same time, Free giveaways and handouts, it's not really development. It's a little bit creating dependencies. And so if we can transfer the risk of carrying cash, but also transfer the who's giving the cash over to the cell phone company, World Vision is no longer there giving the cash. <coughs> right? We are facilitating a process where people receive cash, but we're not giving it. Telemedicine is another thing that's been going on. Uh, I've got a friend in Pakistan who's got a clinic out in a rural area, and he's arranged with Pakistani doctors and doctors of Pakistani descent here in the US and in the UK to basically see patients in this village and have electronic access to their medical files, but to actually see them on the webcam uh, and to do some rather sophisticated diagnoses and treatment plans that they could never get in the village with the physicians who are there, if there are physicians there. In Mozambique, where we were, there are 800 physicians, and there are 21 million people. And in Zambezia, where she was, there's one physician for every 106,000 people. Imagine what telemedicine could do. Um, to some extent, we're also, I think, at the early stages of trying to do what we call communication for development. It's getting the internet into the hands of people in, in, in villages and in urban slums and everything and trying to empower them. And I, th I, I think that we won't do that very well, and the smartphones are going to do it really well. And probably if we just lay, wait for, for that to happen, uh, it'll be like a leapfrogging. I don't, you, you know how Cambodia had like no telephones in the whole country? Like, you know, I don't know, a thousand telephones in the whole country. and then. Cell phones came along, they just leapfrogged. They just bypassed the fixed line system and, you know, and went straight to cell phones and now every Cambodian has a cell phone. And I think we'll see some of that in development as well. People will bypass the internet cafe or the laptop or whatever and they're, and they're gonna go from never having been on a computer or an internet to having one in their hand and having access in their hand. And there's amazing things you can do with that. Um, even low tech, there's amazing things that can, can be done. Uh, in some countries, uh, people are using SMS or text messaging for all sorts of things. One is you can find out about what's going in the market. If you live really far away from the market and you've got an ox cart, or let's say you don't have an ox cart, you have to rent an ox cart, and you want to find out what's the market price today, through an SMS system you'll be able to find out, oh, oh, corn is, uh, corn is three metikais a kilo. Well, that's a little bit low. Let me wait till it goes up to three and a half. Okay, so great things like that are happening. Also with early, early warning systems for, for disasters, natural disasters, hurricanes, um, cyclones, uh, etc. Uh, th there's a lot you can do just with a simple cell phone, even not a smartphone. And so there's a lot there. And, you know, Maxwell School probably isn't really set up to be a technology center. But um, I would say for those of you interested in technology, you could explore ways in, in which a, t a technical background or... or 
uh, you know, telecommunications could be married with an interest in international relief and development. I, I w another trend in the field is, is increasingly uh, a lot of what we call South-South cooperation. Now, it's, it's not a perfect way to categorize it, but the whole idea of the global South, you know, not, not, not Europe and North America, but, you know, everybody south of us, but not Australia or New Zealand either, like everybody north of them. <laughs> uh, it's really sort of the middle band, but, but we call it South-South. And so, for example, Brazil, which we talked about the BRICS earlier, Brazil has recently created the Agência Brasileira de Cooperação, Cooperação, the Brazilian Development Agency. It's the equivalent of USAID. Brazil is going to become a donor. And guess what? USAID is actually trying to hold their hand. And uh, they had a project in Mozambique where USAID and ABC uh, were partnering to do some food security work in, in southern Mozambique. And basically USAID is sort of trying to say, hey Brazil, you know, come on, you're big now. Take on some of this burden. Work with us. We can do it together. Uh, and so that's another trend. And I think uh, it's an interesting trend. And I think for people who are uh, not from North America, but from southern countries, I think there's going to be some interesting career opportunities that probably would, the doors would be closed to me, but they'll, they'll be open to, to some others. Um, I also think that it may mean that people who speak languages of these countries that are going to become donor countries may be in a position of certain advantage. So if you speak Portuguese, I assume you did if you did Peace Corps in Mozambique, you know, you may be in a position where you can sell yourself as a project proposal writer because you can write in Portuguese. And just about anybody else in CARE, Save the Children, World Vision, World Relief, Global, whatever, can't write a project proposal in Portuguese, but you can, and the Brazilians probably only want it in Portuguese. Um, there's another trend which is what I call professionalization and standards. Uh, there's a move towards saying, hey, this, this relief and development work that we do, yeah, it started out as charity and goodwill and everything, but in the end of the day, we have to do a good job. We have to do it well. We have to be efficient. Uh, and so there's more and more and more standards. And I think, by and large, it's a good thing. Uh, the, the big shift was uh, back in about 99 when we came out with SPHERE. SPHERE is a standard for humanitarian relief work, and it's uh, there, there are four, four basic areas, and one is, is, is food programming, one is shelter. I can't remember them. No, shelter's being added, sorry. Uh, and and there they're basically tells you what you need to do in order to, to meet the standard. And there are certain indicators that help indicate that, yes, you've met the standard. So an easy one would be people need 18 liters of fresh water per day, per person. And so if you're setting up something like a refugee camp or a camp for internally displaced people or something, you need to make sure that you've made provisions so that people get 18 liters. And you know what? 14 liters isn't good enough. And 12 is really bad. Okay? And so it's, it's, it's good things like that. And I think that we're going to see more and more professionalization, more and more standards, uh, more and more uh, donors coming together, countries coming together, and meeting and agreeing on things. Um, and there was some big accord in, in uh, Paris a few years back. And if I'd prepared better for this, I'd remember the name of it and I'd tell you, but you can look it up in line, uh, where they agreed on, on some, some, some hum humanitarian uh, frameworks. And there's a lot of these things going on. And more and more, uh, the international NGOs like mine are working with the UN family, as well as uh, multilateral institutions uh, and even bilateral donors, big countries like France, the US, UK, to agree on these things together. We're sitting at the table together. So it's not being imposed necessarily on NGOs, uh, but it's something that we're, we're a part of, and I think by and large we agree on it. Okay, so that was part two of the talk, trends in the field as I see them. Part three is how to land a job. Okay, I can't give you a magic formula. There is no magic formula. And you guys have probably heard a fair amount already. I know it's early in the year. MPA students arrived like, what, four weeks ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this might be one of your early career things. But by, by May, you'll be just so tired of getting advice <laughs> <laughs> from, from people. Um, I don't think there is anything that's tried and true. I think the bottom line is we're in a big world, and people get jobs in all sorts of different ways, and you don't necessarily land the dream job first. Uh, and sometimes the, the, the job that looks rather uninteresting and unappealing is actually a stepping stone to the dream job and you just didn't see it. Uh, so, um, so, so what's my advice? Uh, number one, recognize that sometimes <laughs> there are stepping stones to getting to where you want to be. And if you know where you want to go, that's great. Right? You can set out your roadmap and try to get there. Or if you're like me where you didn't know where you want, 
I didn't know where I wanted to go. Um, well, you can still recognize that, okay, I don't know where I want to go, but wherever I'm going, everything on the way is a stepping stone. And while I'm stepping from here to there, I can look around and see wh what looks interesting and which direction do I want to go in. And, and it's remarkable how, many, how, how sometimes things uh, come down to luck or chance. Um, when I was in Bosnia, in my first job in Bosnia, I was humming along, enjoying my work. It was new, it was challenging. I sort of changed careers. Um, and our regional director, so he would have been two levels above me, came for a visit. And um, I, I don't know, I had him to my office and we went out for lunch with my team. Two days later, uh, my boss is, says to me, David, that was his name, David. David wants to send you to Albania. He thinks you'd be great to, to run our project in Albania. <laughs> I, just, I just laughed and I said, okay, well, actually, I'm just learning my job here. I'm starting to feel like I'm good at it. Is it going to be really bad if I say no? Okay, and so there's one of those things where there was a stepping stone missed. I could have ended up in Albania, and guess what? It was just before the Kosovo War, and I don't think I would have enjoyed it. I, I think I made the right decision, um, although it might have been good for my career. So, so there are stepping stones along the way, and you can recognize them. Um, and I think it is okay to say no, uh, although early on, um, if you say no, you better know why. In my case, I, you know, I had a nice job. I had a contract. I could afford to say no <laughs> because... I, I, could, I had a good reason for, for, for staying where I was. Um, but I, I, in, in terms of advice, besides staying open to the possible and really looking around, uh, besides being willing to do something that doesn't look like exactly what you want because it may lead you somewhere, I would give a few other pieces of advice, and it's probably all cliche. Um, study something that you can determine is needed. Right? Study or get experience doing something that will give you an edge over others that might put you into a market niche. I gave the example of monitoring and evaluation. Um, I gave the example of how languages um, could, could affect things. I mean, for example, um, I routinely hire people to come and work in Mali. And there are certain positions I will not hire somebody without French skills. Or only if I'm really making a huge sacrifice or compromise because I just, I just can't find the person I need who has the French skills. Uh, so language skills can be really, really big. Computer skills, uh, data, SPSS, all that quant quantitative stuff. Um, so that's one thing. Is if, if you do have that roadmap, if you have a sense of where you want to go, then make sure that you're preparing yourself so that you'll be a competitive, uh, a competitive uh, candidate. Uh, or maybe not a competitive candidate, but maybe just right place, right time. You're interning somewhere and the boss comes in and says, ah, I just got this real problem. I need somebody with, with data skills. And you can just sort of meekly say, well, actually, I was really good at stats at Maxwell. <laughs> okay? And, and that's my second thing, or third, or I, I lost count. <laughs> uh, be bold. I advise people to be bold. Had I not chased Jim Kelly out of the room, I wouldn't have ended up working for CRS in Bosnia and then all the dominoes that have fallen since then. Um, I tend to be a little gregarious, but I think all of us have our shy side, and I really had to push myself to chase him out of the room. I really had to push myself to go to these meetings where everybody in the room to me was a stranger, and I had to push myself to go and shake people's hands and introduce myself. Um, and I, I don't know if this says it, but you know, I was the president of MacPAC. Mac, Max, MaxPAC? Yeah, Max, but the student association here for the MPAs, right? And so you wouldn't think that uh, it would be hard for the president. Yeah, but no, it's hard for all of us. Uh, and sometimes you just have to push yourself and, and say, you know what, the hell with it. I'm going to put my embarrassment aside, set my ego aside, whatever, and just plunge forward. Uh, I advise lots of people to consider internships or volunteering part-time work, temporary work. Nobody wants to hear it. Everybody wants to leave Maxwell and just go into this fantastic job. But really, sometimes those are stepping stones that, that, that get you there. Uh, and I've seen time and time and time again how that happens. My boss in CRS, uh, when I was in Nigeria, started at CRS as an intern. And they just, every couple of years, just went up and up and up, you know? And uh, so, yeah, by the time he was probably younger than I am now. He was a regional director responsible for a big chunk of Africa. Uh, and he started as an intern. Um, temporary work, um, 
happens all the time, and uh, this is far outside of, of relief and development. You fill in to do a maternity cover for five months, they see that you're good, something opens up, you're there. Um, Peace Corps is a great example, or other types of overseas volunteering. Uh, the bottom line is in relief and development, very few hiring managers want to hire somebody who hasn't already worked, quote unquote, in the field, right? So, uh, you know, if you grew up in Panama, then you've already been in the field. But if you grew up in Syracuse and you haven't really lived and worked much outside of Syracuse except Rochester, um, probably nobody's going to want to hire you to go and work in Mali for example. Uh, so, but if you can go and be a volunteer with, you know, there's dozens and dozens of different volunteer programs, and some are 10 weeks, and some are two years, or whatever, um, even mission work, then you have the credibility. Oh yeah, you've, you've, you've been out in the field. You've lived in difficult conditions. You've shown that you understand the cultural challenges of, of living in Asia, or Africa, or Latin America, or whatever. Um, and, and finally, I would say, uh, and this ties into Be Bold, um, Pack your bags. If you know exactly where you want to be working, and that was my, my good luck in 1997, <coughs> I knew I wanted to be working in Bosnia. Nothing against Romania, but I wasn't interested in Romania. I wasn't interested in Croatia, which is where my wife is from. Uh, I was interested in Bosnia. That's where I wanted to go, and I packed my bags, and I went. Um, and I paid the rent back in Boston for two or three months as I had a backup plan. You know, If all, everything fails, I can still come back to Boston. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes that's what it takes. I have hired quite a few people who just happen to be there. Oftentimes we need to hire, and we need to hire quickly. Um, you know, sometimes you may have the good fortune to be able to work something out. You know, your friend is working in, you know, pick a place, Nairobi, and you ask your friend, can I come and stay for three months, and while I'm there I'll look for, for work. And then, okay, you don't have to pay rent. You tie right into his or her network. Um, and and it, sometimes it is just right place, right time. Uh, and so if you're in that place because you packed your bags and you were bold, that says something about you. And that says something to the hiring manager. You know, here's somebody who wanted to be here so badly that she or he got on a plane and flew out here without a job. That might be the kind of person I want to hire. Okay. Um, I meant to say the obvious because everybody's going to tell it to you until you're, until you're blue in the face. Um, network, network, network. You can never go wrong networking. Uh, and I mean, the great thing about Facebook and LinkedIn and all that is that now, like, social networks, is, it's cool. It's, it's, what, it's just what you do. It's part of life, right? When I was growing up, social networks weren't like that. You really had to work hard to create social networks. But I would say use those social networks and use those electronic tools that are available to you. Um, you know, I, when I was job hunting a while back, uh, you know, I, I got onto LinkedIn and I started networking with people and I wasn't sure whether I wanted to stay with World Vision. I, th I thought, let me also look outside World Vision, see what's going on. And I connected up with some people uh, through LinkedIn who I hadn't met or, you know, friends of friends. I'll see that somebody's working here and that's an organization I'm interested in and then I'll look through my connections. Oh yeah, I've got a second level contact with that person. Let me make that connection. Uh, you know, I'm a hiring manager. I hire people all the time, and a lot of people don't come in the front door. It's not that we don't want to be transparent or follow the practices, but just, you know, the bottom line is we are a world of humans, and humans network. And if somebody comes to me and says, oh, I know so-and-so, they did a great job in this other country, I'm more likely to hire that person. Or if somebody writes me and says, will you give 20 minutes to this person who's my... Uh, my nephew's friend, then I'll give 20 minutes to that person because they asked. And this goes back to being bold. If you don't ask, you're probably not going to get anything. You have to ask for people's time. And here's the weird thing. If you study psychology, I'm not a student of psychology, but it's out there. People like to help people. Right? People like to help people. Anytime people ask me for time to talk about career things or whatever, I give it to them. It's a good break from my day. It's payback. You have the opportunity to help them, but you don't know when you're going to, maybe you won't help them, but even just giving them information, giving them the perspective is help, right? And so, um, if you are bold, and if you network, and if you push yourself in people's faces, those people will probably be willing to help you. Not everyone, I'm sure there are exceptions. If you catch somebody on the wrong day, they might be grumpy. Uh, if you caught me two days before I was trying to leave Mali, I wouldn't have given you any time. I was 
pretty stressed out. But mostly, people are willing to do it. But you have to ask. You have to get in their face. You have to be bold. All right, that was probably more than 30 minutes. Um, but I suppose we can have a little time for questions, okay. right? Yeah. OK. This gentleman's a repeat offender. He's, he's already come and heard me speak once. Okay? <laughs> and I, I got to say, I'm really disappointed that nobody sat next to me, because last year, the, the woman who sat next to me um, got an internship with World Vision. Because <laughs> 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 she was bold, and she asked. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, her internship is with World Vision in Mali, and because of the security situation right now, it's not clear whether she will be able to go. Uh, part of that, should I say this on tape? Part of that's because Maxwell didn't want to sign the agreement, the Maxwell School. Uh, but uh, part of that also is the U.S. government was going to fund her to come to Mali, and the U.S. government uh, right now is a little bit anti-Mali, <laughs> uh, shall I say. And so um, she may not have the opportunity to, to intern with us in Mali. but. Um, over to you, if there are any questions. Yeah, yeah. Please feel free to have questions or anything that will come up during the presentation. So uh, how can we uh, focus on the mission from the field? Or how can we get used to the local culture? So what is the most the important thing that, that we are probably uh, if we can trust, at least if we can respect their local culture, mm -hmm. we need to try to the fight in each other's mm -hmm. conflict. We can, if we intervene and respect both tribes' of culture and they don't have more knowledge, and if we can respect their culture, even though they, they may be refugees or uh, they have nothing, mm -hmm. but however, if we can respect their culture or history, it, it, it's an important way how we can we communicate with them and uh, help them to know the reality of them. Uh, if they are fighting long time, the uh, conflict is very serious, it is very difficult to establish a friendship mm. in the future. Mm. But uh, at least uh, we can advise them, we can respect each other slowly. To do so, we have to respect each of them. Mm. Uh, how to focus on the our mission, uh, we have to get used to the local culture, if we not refusing that culture, but uh, how can we respect their local culture, it's really important too, because yeah. I'm from Japan, and yeah. respect American culture here, American yeah. people here, yeah. so. Uh, okay, um, look, I'm not a conflict uh, prevention expert or, or a conflict resolution expert, but I have worked in countries where there's conflict. Uh, in Nigeria, we had communal conflict. It's often pitted as being Muslim Christian, but it isn't really. It's inter-ethnic. You have one ethnic group and another ethnic group, uh, and it might be that one group is predominantly Christian and one predominantly Muslim, but it's not really about religion. Uh, in, the, in the Balkans, certainly, I worked uh, in Bosnia uh, where there was a, a really nasty conflict. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if I fully understood your question, but I, I, I do think that uh, we as development workers or relief workers need to model respect. We need to model uh, openness. We need to model um, tolerance and a willingness to try to understand the other. But in the end of the day, no matter how much we model, there are things that are very deep-seated. And I don't know that we can always just through our modeling uh, change things. Sometimes there is the, again, the power of the dollar. When I worked in Bosnia Herzegovina, I would sometimes sit at a table like this with uh, Bosniak, Croat, and Serb representatives. Um, and they would sometimes be in dispute with each other. Sometimes they wouldn't even want to talk to each other. But there were a, a couple important things that we did. Number one, we gave them a safe place. It was understood that wh what was said at the table needed to be respectful. Uh, and that as the convener, as an international NGO, and myself not even being from Bosnia, we had some level of neutrality. And that they respected our neutrality. Uh, and sometimes we're willing to say things to each other that I think they wouldn't have said otherwise. But because we were there, we, we gave them a safe space. And so we had to do everything to, possible to try to make it a safe space. Um, but we also had money. 
And you know, our deal was we would work with the, with the community. We had what was called a community working group that met weekly or every two weeks. And they would help make decisions to guide our programming. So we had the money from the donor, but the deal was then the community would help make some decisions about how that, those funds would be spent. Um, and so the deal was they had to get along. They had to you know, play by the rules. They had to work together in order for us to be able to release that money because that was our agreement with our donor. Uh, and so I think sometimes you know, we, we cajoled people into getting along because they wanted the ultimate benefit, which was you know, rebuilding a school, rebuilding houses, other types of, of, of programming. I don't think there's any perfect solution, and I think everything is context-based. Uh, and so you have to look at what's going on. But certainly as development workers, I think we have to model uh, respect, openness, and, and, and tolerance. Yeah. Sure. Sure. And then also, um, one of the frustrations that I found in my own work with nonprofits on the ground um, in developing countries has been that there is a lack of donor education um, a lot of times. And I wanted to know if there's any push in that direction right now based on yeah. your. Okay. Let me try to tackle those in one answer. Two. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You, you know, in terms of in, in terms of, of, of coordination and initiative, I think there's a lot of, of efforts, and some maybe have worked better than others. Uh, some might be more in pilot phase. So, for example, uh, in Mozambique, where I worked, uh, we did a lot of work in Zambezia province. And in Zambezia province, the U.S. government was funding, you know, six or eight different health-related projects. Uh, and they sort of, at the USAID mission, said, well, let's try to do something different. Let's try to integrate. And so they pulled together different funding streams, which is not easy for the U.S. government. Has anybody worked for the U.S. government? They pulled together different funding streams. Their maternal and child health funding stream, their HIV and AIDS funding stream, their nutrition funding stream. And they tried to pull them together, and they, and they created an integrated uh, project package and then put out a call for proposals. And what it meant was that there would be one very large project for all of Zambezia province, with multiple public health outcomes. There was even water and sanitation built into it. Uh, and it also meant that then one consortium of actors would win it, rather than having, oh, you know, one part of Zambezia right now, we have a health project that's run by ADRA, another part is, is, is uh, World Vision, another part is, is IRD. Now it's pulling everybody together. So we had to put together a monster consortium, and we ended up with seven uh, organizations, which I think was too large, and that's one of the lessons that's probably being learned out of that experience. But it was really great to have so many different uh, health interventions under one roof of one project, and then we could go and work with the donor or with uh, the, uh, the provincial government and speak to all of these different things that we were doing within one project. Um, for fu there's also some other ways in which that's being done with funding. In the UN system, um, particularly around disasters, there's something called the, it's called the CAP. I think it's Coordinated Assistance Plan. Mm -hmm. It's an acronym. And basically now in, in a lot of uh, emergencies, one of the things that they do is they say, okay, everybody who wants to help out here, come to the table. It's done by sectors. And let's talk about what we want to accomplish and who wants to do what where. And, and then basically proposals are vetted and only some proposals are selected. And it's all packaged into a, cons a coordinated, consolidated package. And then donors, such as US government or other governments, can pick and choose from the projects, knowing that we won't be duplicating the work of somebody else. Because that coordination has occurred already in the coordination stage. And um, so, I mean, we, in, in Mali, we, we participated in three of these. One was for food security. There are 18 proposals, only 10 of them were actually selected to be put into the package. Okay. 
Okay. The problem with the CAPs historically is that they're really underfunded. I, the last I knew the CAP in Mali was at less than 30% funding. But So there are attempts like that. In terms of donor education, I mean, that's a, that's a long conversation. We can talk afterwards if you want. I mean, there's plenty of people in this, fi in this field, both you know, in, in NGOs, but particularly in, on the donor side, who don't necessarily know that much about development. Um, a, a lot of donors are diplomats who have gone into development. Uh, and so they may have trained at the Foreign Service Institute, but that doesn't mean they know much about water and sanitation in, you know, rural Africa. Yeah, I think there's attempts going on, but I don't know. There's also some really, really smart donors and some people who are very, very committed. Um, I speak mostly about bilateral donors who are, you know, different countries. There's also a, a, no, a whole other uh, realm of donors who I don't have that much experience with, but you have like the Gates Foundation and other foundations like that who are highly professional. And I mean, those Gates people, they're, they're brilliant. We actually have a former Gates person from my class, uh, a former Maxwell person from my class. Um, she worked in the Clinton administration. My name will come, Gabrielle, Gabrielle Bushman. Yeah, she's at the Gates Foundation. You had a question. I did. Thank you very much for being here. Um, as you talk about your career, I just, the word adaptable, just like, it's bold in my head. Yeah. Um, and so part of that, I'm sure, is just the nature of the work and why you are, um, you're just probably built for that. You're saying, you know, this is where they need help, so this is where I'm going to stay. But to me, I read just all the different fields, which is food security, health, nutrition, you know, everything that you've worked in. Um, so it's not that you necessarily, you know, it's more the jack of all trades. You don't necessarily have an expertise, you know, right in HIV or, or yeah. this or that. So what are the skills that you think make you so adaptable um, <laughs> okay. to be able to kind of move or go yeah. wherever you're going? Okay. Um, I, I'm going to qualify uh, my response by first saying that I think that the field that I'm in more and more and more needs technical specialists, mm -hmm. and I'm not one. Uh, we hire lots and lots of people for their technical skills. Um, it would be very unusual for us to hire somebody to manage a public health project funded by the U.S. government unless that person himself or herself was a public health specialist, hopefully with a master's in public health, and project management experience. Um, and I've sort of skimmed above that, and I get to play leadership roles. Uh, <laughs> and I suppose what, uh, yeah, I, I have made myself adaptable. I have said, you know, I won't be a technical expert in every area. I can't, there are too many areas, even within the field of, of development, to be an expert in all of them. So what I can do is try to learn enough about each and make sure that I hire and work with really competent people who do have the technical skills that I lack. Okay? I happen to be a really, really curious person. And so for me, it's exciting. If, if I take on a, a project area or an area that I haven't worked in before, it's a learning opportunity. And so, you know, those, I mean, I didn't know that much about HIV and AIDS hadn't really done HIV and AIDS programming we, uh, before I went to, to, to Nigeria and then suddenly I had an HIV project. Uh, I hardly worked on it and then I got transferred to Pakistan and then, you know, lo and behold, I ended up running a nationwide HIV and AIDS project. Well, you know, I had to be a fast study. Um, and then again, that's also where networking, I think, comes in handy because other people know so much. You don't have to know it all. You need to know who knows it. You need to talk to people who know it and learn enough so that you can speak intelligently, and, uh, and yeah, you have to be willing to, to say, okay, I'm not going to make certain decisions because they're technical decisions. I will go to the technical experts. So what I do is I make strategic decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, even on strategic decisions, I usually am asking for, for technical advice. Um, so I think, you know, being curious and, again, being open, you know, uh, you know, there might be certain sectors that I'm just not that interested in. But I understand that they're important. So I have to be open to having space for them, and, and even if I'm less curious about a particular area than I am about another area, I have to give it the same amount of attention. I can't just follow my, my curiosity. So, um, you know, I, I've been adaptable in terms of countries as well, and I think, again, uh, that's just been a willingness to, 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 to go more or less where there are opportunities or where I think needed. But, uh, you know, I, I didn't tell you the whole story. I, I've turned down I've turned down opportunities along the way because they were in countries I didn't want to be in. Uh, I turned down an option, an opportunity in Tajikistan because I was concerned about healthcare there, and I have a six-year-old son. And I, I mean, basically, I was told if it's anything more than a flu, you have to fly to Turkey or Dubai to get healthcare. And I just thought, you know what, I don't need that. So uh, being adaptable is good, but I think you know, all of us also need to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> 
kind of a, a question or comment. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's about measuring impact. This is something I've been struggling with in my work. I mean, perhaps when you're doing projects like building schools or hospitals, and you can count, okay, we've built uh, five schools, and we've had... That's I not impact. My, but when you're doing... M my work consisted more um, in doing workshops, uh, summer schools, conferences. You, you got people together from the constitutional course and the yeah. Balkans, for instance, to discuss yeah. things that are of interest to them. Then you have to go back to your summer organization and report how much you've achieved by doing this type of projects. And I mean, here when when reporting, we were like, so why are we going to write here that people got together and discussed about individual petition to the constitutional court? And this was something that really, when you when you're doing this type of project, how do you measure impact? I think it's very diff difficult. I mean, the great thing about relief is that a lot of relief is just what. Some people call it trucking and chucking. You truck the food or something, tents, <laughs> plastic sheeting, to a place, and you chuck it out. Right? You give it to me. And you count it. It's totally quantifiable. That's the great thing about it. But, okay, so I gave somebody a tent. So, okay, the impact is they're not sleeping under the stars. But they're still refugees or they're still displaced. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the real impact is to get them home if that's possible. Uh, so, I, I mean, I think, I think measuring impact is very, very difficult. And I think for people who like monitoring and evaluation, it must be a, a fascinating field. Um, one of the things that you do is you try to write indicators. And an indicator points to it, indicates something, indicates success. Uh, and I think it's really, really hard to write good indicators. Um, and even when you write good indicators, sometimes they're hard to measure. I mean, if, if, for example, easy indicator. We say, in this community, uh, right now there's a... Uh, the baseline is 50%. 50% of, of, of children get uh, malaria by the time they're age five. We want that to go to 20% in three years. Easy indicator to write. But, and then how do you actually, in a particular community, measure prevalence of malaria when you don't necessarily have doctors, when every fever is assumed to be malaria, even though there's so many other things that can cause fever? So I, I think, I mean, you think it's hard in, I understand it is really hard in the fluffy stuff like workshops, but it's even hard in the concrete stuff like malaria. You know, because at a national level, we may be able to measure, yeah, malaria prevalence with children under five. What if we choose a, an age group that is different from the data that's collected normally by the government? Mm -hmm. Let's say the government normally collects data for children under five, but for some reason we decide we want to focus on children under seven. Nobody's collecting that data. So, that's why I think it's actually it's a burgeoning field. It's an interesting field. Um, and I think in, when it comes to indicators, also some of your indicators may be what are called proxy indicators. You say you assume that if something has happened, it probably means that you had some success. Um, and uh, what I think in the field that I'm in, we still do too much of, and I think we're trying to move away from, is, is what are called output indicators, or worse, input indicators. You just measure what was put out, you know. We built five schools. Big deal. If you have five schools that look beautiful, but there's no furniture, where are the kids going to sit? Right? You got five beautiful schools and brand new furniture, but guess what? There's no teacher willing to go and work in that community. Let's say that you even have a teacher, but the teacher doesn't show up. They're what we call a ghost teacher, right? They're just collecting the salary. They have to give 20% of it to somebody in the Ministry of Education who got them the job, and then that gets shared all the way up to the minister but they're not teaching. All those things. You know. So what do you really measure? What we have done at World Vision is we have said we're going to set some targets, some very specific targets, uh, around what we call child well-being. And we are a child-focused agency, and so we, we picked um, nutrition and health as two key areas, as well as education. And so for education, we're now trying to measure and see how many children, what is the percentage of children who can read and write by age 11. That's our target. And we'll still have to decide what does it mean that they can read and write? How do we, how do we measure that? But for us, that's it. We said, okay, it's not about building schools. It's not about providing books. It's not even about training teachers, because you can have tons of training workshops, but teachers don't pay attention, or they leave the system, or it doesn't take, or the wrong people are in the room. What it's really about is, can children, have children learned? And so that's what we're doing. We're trying to sort of simplify the indicators and get to something where 
we feel like, yeah, okay, if children can read and write, we've had an impact. If we build a beautiful school, we might not have had an impact. And that's challenging, because that's a mentality shift. And you know, a lot of my staff have been building schools for 25 years. <laughs> and they like building schools. <laughs> and it's a nice thing to leave behind. And guess what? Communities ask us to build schools. That's the funny thing. Communities don't ask us to come in and teach their kids to write. They ask us to build schools. So it looks like, oh, well, it's what the community wants. We're good at it. We know how to do it. It's an easy way to spend money. But what's the impact? And so that's, I think, why it's an interesting field, Emini. You had your hand up in the back. <laughs> You know, there's this funny thing. On one hand, there's this push for demonstrating impact and evidence basis. On the other hand, there's still a huge amount of interest in innovation. Uh, and I think actually, you're, writing a project proposal is really an exercise in marketing. You're trying to sell an idea, right? You're trying to sell your organization. You're basically trying to say, we have this great idea, and either we think it will work because we've done it before, look at our great experience, or we think it'll work, although it's never been done. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Please fund us. Okay? <laughs> and you would be surprised by how many donors really want to go for the new and exciting, because if they fund something that's new and exciting, and it works, hey, they've got something to brag about back in headquarters, back in the capital, you know, back in the home country. Um, innovation is actually, I think, uh, it was the theme of, one of the themes of our National Directors Conference. Every 18 months I attend a National Directors Conference for all the National Directors uh, around the world who work for World Vision. Our president calls us together. And it was one of the themes. We spent half a day talking about innovation. Uh, and I was, you know, really happy to learn that there's a lot of innovative stuff going on within World Vision around the world different pilot projects, some of which we fund ourselves. That's another thing. Sometimes we'll say, this is a neat idea. Let's do it. If it works, we can get other people to pay for it later. So our last mile mobile solutions that I mentioned, it's this package where we do everything electronically that we used to do on paper in terms of registering uh, uh, beneficiaries for different types of distributions. Uh, we paid for that with private money because we thought it's a great idea. And once we've proven that it works, the donors will come on board and they'll pay for it. Um, in World Vision has offices in different wealthy countries, which we call support offices because they provide us moral, technical, and financial support. In Canada, they've actually uh, created a department of innovation. Uh, and they're actively trying to find and promote innovation and look and see which innovations are replicable. And replication is something that's quite interesting in, in our field because if you do something in one location, it doesn't mean it'll work somewhere else, but it might. And so there's a big focus on piloting things, innovating, and then taking things to scale. And as you take, the, the, the real challenge actually is taking them to scale. If it worked in a village in Mexico, is it gonna work in a village in Colombia? Yes, no, maybe, I don't know. But how do we do that? Um, and I think that uh, many of us in the field, we, we have what uh, people like to call a cookie cutter approach, right? You, know, you have a, a, a cutter to make cookies and every cookie is the same size and the same shape. You just do it like that. And the world is not like that. So uh, there's actually a lot of room for innovation within innovation. That is, we innovated, we have this neat idea. But now we have to be innovative as we figure out how to adapt that idea and replicate it in different places around the world with di totally different contexts. Um, I wanted to say one more thing, and I, I'll still take another question or two, but I have focused on what I do and the nonprofit sector, NGOs. I will take your question. But I, I, before I forget, I want to also say that it's not just up to governments. It's not just up to civil society, organizations like mine, or even the United Nations family. But I think real development uh, also needs strong support from the business world. And although I opened up saying that you know, business focuses on the bottom line and MPA is great because it's multiple and conflicting objectives, the truth is we need the business world. You know, all these technological, uh, technological uh, innovations that I talked about, trends, that's all because those things were developed largely by private sector. Um, and just by chance, I'll put in a plug. My sister uh, works down at Cornell University. 
and they have at the business school the Center for Sustainable Global Enterprise. And I think quite a few business schools have similar things like this, maybe even Syracuse does, where they're basically saying, look, there's a bunch of social problems out there. And some of them have business solutions, or part of the solution is, is, is business. So, you know, take a village in India that's never had clean water and people are sick all the time. You could go in and dig them a tube well and set up some fancy pipe system and everything and everybody would be happy. Or you could go in and help set up a small sustainable business where water is pulled out of the ground and filtered and people pay a very modest fee for filtered drinking water, which then allows one family to have a drinking water filtered business and the whole community gets clean water. But it wasn't all done by an NGO. It doesn't have to be done by an NGO. Private sector can do things. Um, and we depend on private sector products. Uh, so uh, I do want to encourage people not to discount the private sector. Um, some of you have student loans to pay. Private sector tends to pay better. Uh, <laughs> private sector, because of its focus on the bottom line, tends to be more efficient. I see lots of bureaucracy and time wasted and office politics and stuff inside my organization. We are one of the largest NGOs in the world. So as you get bigger, you have more bureaucracy and, and stuff. And certainly pe people I know in the US government complain all the time about it. And I think private sector tends to be less bureaucratic. I know bureaucratic isn't necessarily a dirty word at the Maxwell School. <laughs> you guys are in the midst of your Public administration and democracy course, yeah, and the whole, yeah, I know that. But, uh, <laughs> but the bottom line is I just, I, I just wanted to make a plug for the private sector. Uh, a friend of mine ran a cell phone company in Pakistan. And, um, you know, what cell phones have done for people's development there? Uh, and not just being able to talk to your, you know, cousin who was in Paris, but, um, you know, all sorts of connecting into the world and, and business opportunities. There was a guy in, in, I don't know if you ever saw this, in Alto Malokwe. There's a guy in Alto Malokwe in, in northern, northern Mozambique. He's got a platform about 12 feet high. And you pay him a modest sum to climb his platform because if you stand on his platform, you can get a cell phone signal <laughs> in an area that's otherwise so far underserved by cell phone. Right? So there's amazing things you'd never think of that only come through the private sector. So do not discount the private sector, please. Ma'am, in the back. Yeah, yeah I promised to. Uh, and just, uh, first, I would like you to repeat the name of the Uh Sure, and anybody's welcome to come and talk to me afterwards if you want. Uh, I can't give you this because I haven't. The name? Yes, the Center for Sustainable Global Enterprise at the Johnson School of Management. Yeah. And all three ones. So uh, it's, it's all what we've been seeing from developing countries is yeah. aid. Yeah. And this is not dependence. Yeah. 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 Uh, so what is the extent in the field where of entrepreneurship and community ownership of development projects rather than you were talking about localization in terms of staffing international organizations? But what I was waiting to Sustainability is a big buzzword in, in the field, and it is important. Um, there are thousands of examples of development projects that looked great at the time. And if you go back after three years, five years, ten years, you find nothing. 
right? So much work that we thought was good work wasn't sustained. And there are many, many reasons for that. And one has to do with a lack of local ownership or buy-in. Sometimes it may be a lack of understanding. Sometimes it may be that sustainability just wasn't designed into it, right? Uh, there was a sense that we're going to do something that we think is great. We're going to tell everybody how great it is. And then when we're done, we're going to leave. And it's all about us, right? And that's not good development work. And there's far too many examples of that. And frankly, a lot of that is done by local NGOs. It's not just international NGOs like mine. Lots of local NGOs do the same. I knew NGOs in Pakistan that, you know, they produced the glossiest things and you'd think they were fantastic. But if you actually went and looked at their work, you'd find nothing. Um, worse, sometimes uh, there were NGOs that would lie. You know, they'd, they'd show you a video of the school they built, but then you'd go out there and you find out that somebody else built it. <laughs> um, and there's lots and lots and lots of examples like that. So to, to go to your question, um, you know, I think communities and others do need to be involved in design. And I think there's this balance that we're all trying to find. And it's a challenging balance. On one hand, um, it is the job of civil society, I think, to help introduce new ideas. New ideas that aren't necessarily organic and from the community. You know, the horizons that some of us have because of all the countries we've worked in are, are things that should be shared. I really, I really think so. You know? And so, for example, you, you gave an, uh, an example of, of toilets not being used. Uh, we pioneered, we weren't the only ones, but we and some other organizations pioneered uh, an approach that's called community-led total sanitation. It's a mouthful, but basically the idea is you work in a community until every single person in the community is using a latrine, and you certify it. And that goes back to monitoring and evaluation and demonstrating impact. You actually have to prove. I mean, you literally have to interview like the 85-year-old grandmother who's never used a latrine in her life and get her to say truthfully she's now started to use a latrine and she doesn't go into the bush anymore. Okay? Um, something like that may be sustainable. And I think we're even there still trying to figure out, is it sustainable? Because in some communities, that's been done with incentives. That is, when the community becomes certified as having total sanitation, everybody's using the latrines, then you get some type of prize. OK, once you get the prize, and then we walk away. In three years, are people still using the latrines? Do they know how to take care of the latrines? Uh, are there still reasons why they wouldn't use latrines? And there may be lots of good reasons. And so I think you know, some of it has to do with project design and building into the project. Some of it has to do with looking at whether you might have uh, incentives that won't last, or um, occasionally perverse incentives. Um, and, and so you have to balance this introduction of, of new ideas, new ways of doing things, with what the community says they want, or what the community says they think will work. Um, and I mean, look, communities aren't always right. That's the thing. They can say, we want something. We want a school. But what they, what, they're saying we want a school. And what we want them to say is we want our children to be able to read and write. And so there is some negotiated process. Uh, but ultimately, I think if there isn't some level of community buy-in, if that is lacking, then chances are a project is doomed to, to ultimate failure. And will it be two years or 10 years? I don't know. We as an organization have recognized that. We have recognized that our approach is a little bit too much hierarchical and a little bit too much us giving and the community receiving. And we're trying to change our model. And uh, we can't just snap our fingers, so we're phasing it in. But we have a new approach. Uh, and in that new approach, effectively, we are going to the community and saying, we're willing to work with you for 15 years. And you need to guide this. And you need to be actively involved. And we are open to using local organizations as our partners, community-based organizations, even creating new organizations or local business. Uh, and we will be with you as a partner. We'll hold your hand. You tell us what you need. Or if we sense that you need something that you haven't recognized, we're going to tell you what we think you need. But that this is a partnership, and, and, and it's not World Vision doing it for you. World Vision is here as a catalyst. World Vision is here to facilitate something, but you have to actually be the actors in your own development. And you know, I think we're figuring out how do you do that, because that's not easy. It sounds great. It sounds beautiful. Storybook. But to actually do that, you know, um, and I mean, for some communities that have only experienced handouts, that's also a big shift for them. For communities where they think that the rest of the country sees them as being poor and backward, and we're saying, well, yeah, 
we don't see you as poor and backward. We see you as poor, yeah. But let's figure out how to work together. It, it, for some communities, it's going to take them a while to believe us or to believe in themselves. So I, I, I don't think there's a perfect solution. I think we're struggling with this. And frankly, it won't surprise me if 50 years from now, poverty levels are not significantly lower than they are today, in part because of how we approach development, but honestly, in part because of policy issues. And, um, It's a moving target, but I mean, overall, we're working in 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 a structure, and there are policy issues. And you know, what I do at the community level, what my team does at the community level, with the community, that can be undone by you know one bad policy decision tomorrow. Uh, which is why I'm going to Washington next week on my vacation. And I'm going to spend two days talking to decision makers in Washington on Congress, uh, at, in Congress, uh, National Security Council, State Department, to try to help influence their thinking on policy issues in, in Mali, where I work, because I see that the U.S. government has a strong role to play. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate I'm happy to stay and talk to anybody one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, yeah. Officer Kuchari, who's done here. Okay. So thank great. you very much. Sure.